Tina Kotokato. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I have details of additional vaccines en route to New Zealand. But before I speak to that, I'll hand over to the Director General of Health to give us the latest case numbers. Thank Dr. you, Prime Bruce. Minister. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa and uh, maloa le uh, Tongan Language Week this week. There are 13 new community cases to report today. All are in the Auckland region. It takes our total number associated with this outbreak to 868. And of those, pleasingly, 264 cases have now recovered. There are two cases to return uh, uh, in return, returnees in our managed isolation facilities. Today we have 30 unlinked cases as we continue to work through uh, the new ones that came in, many of them first thing this morning, and links are being established. And of the 13 new cases today, over half have already had those links uh, made to the current outbreak. On yesterday's 15 cases, we know that 12 of them are contacts of other cases, and nine of these were household contacts. We also know that six were infectious in the community. There are 31 people in hospital today, all in the Auckland area, and of these, five are in intensive care or a high dependency unit, and three are currently requiring ventilation. Our thoughts remain with these people and their whānau at what is a obviously a stressful time for them. Uh, pleasingly, yesterday there were 17,684 tests processed across the motu and 8,472 swabs taken in the Auckland region. This is a further increase on yesterday and, again, is fundamental to us getting confidence that the outbreak is controlled. Our public health team and clinical teams in Auckland are now widening the scope of surveillance testing to a number of larger essential workplaces to help rule out any undetected community spread. And I want to thank those companies that are working with our teams up there to get those promptly in place. They include today, for example, pop-up testing sites uh, to test staff at several, uh, at a couple of Auckland supermarkets, with a third one of those tomorrow. They are at the moment for workplace staff only, and a reminder to anyone in Auckland that there are now there are still 23 uh, community testing sites operating, as well as general practices and urgent care clinics for you to be tested at. Uh, of our 38,126 people who have been formally identified and included in our uh, contact tracing system, around 87% have had a test already, and our public health units around the country are following up anyone who has outstanding test results. Staff continue to deploy from around the country to support the Auckland DHBs, uh, and there were three ICU nurses going in uh, on Sunday, and a further five being deployed next week. Uh, to help support the Auckland DHB effort. And I want to thank all those staff indeed for putting their hands up. Uh, many others are also in the pipeline to uh, deploy if required. Uh, a quick update on the case that was identified in Middlemore Hospital over the weekend. Day three test results from 124 patients who were considered possible contacts and 29 staff members are in and those have all returned negative and all 149 of those contacts remain in isolation. Uh, I would like to move on to scanning, and I'd like to give a shout out to the many businesses who are displaying QR codes where they are very visible and also accessible to everybody. And I'd like to encourage all uh, organisations that are displaying QR codes to please make sure they are at the right height, with the top of the poster 130 centimetres from floor level, as per the guidance on the Ministry's website, so that they are accessible to everybody, including people using wheelchairs. Uh, finally, we did see a big jump in, um, uh, in scans yesterday as the country moved to alert level two, with 1.6 uh, million scans registered yesterday. Not quite at the record set last September, so we can keep up the good work and aim to beat that scan away, please. Back to you, Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Dr Bloomfield. As you can see, we are making solid progress. But a few days ago, I mentioned the three things we really need everyone to keep doing. They are getting tested, following alert level rules, and getting vaccinated. Our testing numbers have picked up in recent days, which is fantastic. But if we are to have the confidence we need that Delta, the Delta outbreak is under control, we need to test, test, test. 
as well as 22 pop-up testing centres operating throughout Auckland and numerous primary healthcare providers, you will hear us speak to ongoing community-based surveillance opportunities, and we'll share the details of those over the coming days as well. As for the rules, we've seen that if you give Delta an inch, it will take a mile. So please keep up all the scanning, mask wearing, and sticking to the rules and guidelines, no matter where you are in the country. As Dr Bloomfield has said, even with some parts of the country still in heavy restrictions in Auckland, we have seen really good scanning numbers elsewhere, a good early first sign, but please do keep that scanning and record keeping up. It is one of the most important tools that we have for contact tracing uh, in a Delta environment. Now to vaccines, I have an update. I'm pleased today to be able to give you the latest information on our work securing early vaccine supplies, which will allow us to maintain but also build on the record levels of vaccinations we've seen since the outbreak began. As I mentioned earlier in the week, work has been going on behind the scenes with other countries for a couple of weeks now. Today I can announce the first part of that work. Last night we completed the final details of an agreement with Spain which will see New Zealand receive over a quarter of a million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, in addition to our scheduled deliveries. Those quarter of a million doses departed Madrid at 1am New Zealand time and are due to arrive in Auckland tomorrow morning. I can tell you they are on track because I have been following the shipments movements on Flight Tracker. With this supply, we will be able to continue our rollout at significant or even record high levels. This is the first of two deals that we have been working on. The second is an even larger order, and I anticipate being able to share details of it in the next week or so. I want to thank the Government of Spain, and in particular President Pedro Sanchez. I'd also like to acknowledge the Spanish and European Union officials, the team at Pfizer, and the team here in New Zealand who have all helped make it happen. They have been working around the clock, literally day and night. While I cannot go into details of our future arrangements just yet, what I can say for now is that with the assurance of these extra doses, we can keep going uh, with speed until our big scheduled deliveries arrive in October. As you recall, we were actually really working hard to just bridge uh, the constraint we had across the course of this month. As I said on Tuesday, on busy days since the current outbreak began, we've been vaccinating more people per capita than countries like the UK, the US, Australia and Canada did at the peak of their rollouts. In part, this is due to a determined and dedicated group of vaccinators working long days every day to keep our population safe, and I do want to thank those workers. But it's also thanks to the millions of New Zealanders who have showed up and done their bit for the team. It means that 89% of people aged 65 plus have been vaccinated with at least one dose, 89%. And 77% of those aged 40 plus have had at least one dose. And what I find really heartening, given we only opened up to everyone on the 1st of September, is that 64% of people aged 12 plus have had at least one dose. We do, however, want to keep going, which is why officials and agencies have been working so hard, as I've said, to secure doses that allow us to do that. But the rest is up to us. As I stand here today, Auckland is into its fourth long week of a level four lockdown. The rest of the country is having to adapt to a new Delta level two with tighter but necessary rules and limitations. These alert levels are gruelling and hard work, and I know we all want to avoid them in the future. And that's why we need everyone who can be to be vaccinated. High vaccine uptake is part of our path to opening back up confidently. I've been asked often, what is the magic number? How many of us need to be vaccinated? My answer is everyone. In part, that's because I hate the idea of even one preventable death. And with the vaccine, we know that the chances of someone's life being taken by COVID is dramatically reduced. But it's more than that. If everyone who can be vaccinated is vaccinated, you are potentially saving the life of someone who can't be. There have been many devastating stories in this outbreak, including the case of a one-year-old child who fell ill with the virus. In fact, 121 of the New Zealanders who have tested positive in the last three weeks are under nine years old. These are children 
who at this stage cannot be vaccinated. So they need us to be, all of us. In 2020, our COVID response led the world. In 2021, I want our vaccine rates too. So if you're a business owner who wants to avoid lockdown and you've already been va vaccinated, there is more you can do. You can encourage and support your workforce to be vaccinated. If you're in a sports team and you're being vaccinated, there is more you can do. You can encourage all your teammates to get vaccinated. And if you're a vaccinated faith leader who wants your congregation to continue to be able to worship together, you can help support and enable that by supporting your congregation to be vaccinated as well. We now have enough vaccines to vaccinate everyone who, in New Zealand who is eligible at PACE. So now it's up to us. If you haven't already been vaccinated, there are a range of places that you can be, including GP clinics, drive through centres, Marae Bay centres, community pharmacies and Pacific providers. More primary care sites are coming on stream each day, along with more drive throughs Walk-ins or drive throughs are welcome at the Auckland Airport Park and Ride and the Trust Arena in Henderson. And the first in a series of Pacifica mass vaccination events started today in Auckland. Outside of Auckland, there is a drive through at 223 Kio Reroa, uh, Whangarei, and walk-in clinics at Te Awa, uh, in Hamilton, Oratoa Clinic in Porirua, and Pipitea Marae in Wellington, and a number of other sites around the country. So to everyone, if you're not yet vaccinated, make a booking or drop into a site that allows walk-ins today. Let's see if we can top the tables, but more importantly, let's make sure we look after one another. Happy to take questions. Um, yeah, at, thank you. At um, Middlemore Hospital, we know that staff uh, didn't have room to shift the patient after he was tested, and others have had to be discharged early due to a lack of space. Are you worried that our health system just simply won't cope in the event of a more significant outbreak? Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. What I can say is the health system has been preparing for a surge like this, and in the Auckland region has coped very well. It's had support from around the country. Um, of course, we're just coming out of winter, and you would have seen only four to six weeks ago, our health system was, um, you know, was dealing with quite a big outbreak of uh, RSV, particularly amongst children, and it is used to adapting and making sure that everyone who needs care can receive that care. So. I'm confident the health system has been prepared for this resurgence. I think this, this is a big outbreak and it's done very well. The, the future, of course, is for us to make sure that that uh, response can be sustained, especially as the population gets more highly vaccinated and we start to move through the, uh, the pathway towards reconnecting to the world. And we've got a lot of ongoing work around this. And um, Prime Minister, one for you. A third patient in the room with um, a third patient in the room with the COVID patient at Middlemore says it's strange that neither the, the government nor the hospital accept that things were managed poorly. Are you satisfied, as Prime Minister, that everything's gone well at Middlemore and what was happened was just to be expected? Oh, I, I've never characterised it in in that way um, because I don't think that that is a fair characterisation. Uh, what I believe happens is that in these stressful environments that we've seen a situation where staff have as much as possible um, tried to do the right thing. There's screening as people came in. There were certain symptoms and criteria, uh, symptoms that they were shared with them. Uh, then they've undertaken some testing. And of course, in the aftermath of that, seeing that they had a COVID positive case. And then that causes us to look in hindsight as to what else could have been done. I think what we're reflecting here is that we do have clinicians that are working in a really difficult environment, that they do the very best they can with the information they have at the time, but we'll always be willing to look back, reflect, and see what could be done better. So the news reported a story uh, which included Pacific people yeah. concerned at um, MIQ. Know, MIQ. Yep. And today we're being told that MIQ has announced a partnership with Pacifica Futures to help the needs of Pacifica in MIQ. Why did it take things to get so bad? So I'll just, if I can correct that timeline, Pacifica Futures were already involved. Uh, I can't give you the exact date that they've started working with MIQ, um, but it didn't start um, yesterday. It's been in place for uh, a little while. But I'll perhaps get Dr Bloomfield to speak to some of what he, uh, we understand has occurred in this case. And if you then have a more general question around those partnerships, I'd be happy to speak to that. 
I think the key point I'd like to make is that um, there is clinical uh, expertise on site in all our quarantine facilities 24-7, and that includes uh, uh, GP and or nurse practitioners. And in this case, um, I know that the, p the person was assessed uh, more than once, including by a GP, and um, I'm glad that the person, you know, their, their health needs were looked after, and they, at, at the time that it was required, transfer to hospital was made, and they're doing well and, and stable on the ward there. Um, I can also just affirm what the Prime Minister said. Pacifica Futures has been involved since last week with supporting um, all those whānau, particularly Pacific Fano in the quarantine facilities uh, on a range in a range of ways, and uh, that's I think been very helpful in addressing some of the concerns that uh, some of the families had in there. Last week isn't a very long time, so you obviously saw a need there, um, and having to plug those gaps. You know, did we move fast enough to get um, you know that support in place for these people? I think the, the one thing I'd say is that our, our managed isolation facilities have had over 160,000 New Zealanders enter into them you know, from a, a range of different um, places and a range of different walks of life. Um, but what we, of course, recognise is it's not just enough to have information provided in multiple languages, for instance. What we were seeing with this outbreak is that it's very different to have someone who's knowing that they're going in to come into a facility for a number of weeks versus someone who gets information sometimes uh, only hours before that they need to go into quarantine. They're also grappling with the fact that they have COVID-19. They're likely having to bring their family with them. It's a very stressful and difficult environment with very little room for error. So we have had to make sure we're catering for that difference in the way that we're using MIQ. I'd like to think now that we're taking and utilising all those community providers that can help us with that job, um, but there will always be things that we can improve and fix. Do you think this will restore confidence in the system with regard to the Pacific community? I think people can see that we're working really hard and trying to constantly make improvements to the system. Even, for, for instance, working really hard with families before they go on to managed isolation so they know what to expect, what they need to bring with them, what, the, what kind of care and services they'll pro be provided in the facility, uh, and that bridging and support beforehand is proving helpful. We need to make sure that we keep that up while people are uh, in quarantine, recognising that it is a quarantine facility. So the ability of NGOs and having too many people coming and going is constrained, but that doesn't mean we can't provide good support. In terms of future, uh, yeah, Jane. In terms of future plans, um, now we're dealing with Delta, um, is the potential for more MIQ capacity less likely now? And also, can you talk a bit to um, Chris Hipkins' comments that being able to risk rate countries m may now not be possible, and what that actually means for the border reopening plan next year? Yeah, so I think, you know, what the Minister was referring to yesterday is, is actually not a change in position, but the ongoing acknowledgement that we've always said, with variants of concern, we've got to be, we've got to make sure that we're all are always appropriately risk assessing. And so his reference was to the fact that we have this reconnecting framework, um, uh, which remains in place, but within that we have country risk assessments, and just a reference to the importance of the individual risk assessment within a country, because actually with these variants of concern, uh, individual cases of Delta are hugely problematic, and so you need to build that into your risk profiling for every country. Isn't that going to be, um, it, it's quite a key component though, like the different quarantining and isolation arrangements, yep. for example, are a mix of people's vaccination status yes. and where they're coming from, so isn't that a really integral part um, of that response in terms of being able to phase and offer different options? It isn't so much that you're a traveller. Uh, and so um, that yes, that's um, but it's but it's again as I say that's all built into the framework already. It's just then what those individual uh, uh, country profiles look like in the way that we're risk assessing. And again, vaccine status is one of the most important factors within that. If everything's seen as effectively high risk, then you know how does that allow you to do different thresholds or different responses? Yeah, and of course, accepting of course there are still parts of the world. Uh, like, for instance, just to take an example within the Pacific, that still have a very different risk profile than other parts of the world. But I think what we've always said is within this risk framework, we've always got to be willing and able to adapt to the variants of concern. I think there's been an assumption that somehow our reopening plans have dramatically changed. I'd say that is not the case. We just have to build in, as I say, the impact of Delta in the way that we risk profile. But we've always kept room for that.
tick my cue, mm. this delta mean that there is now less likely um, ability to increase capacity at MIQ? Uh, no. Uh, no, I don't see it necessarily affecting uh, the capacity, but we're always looking for ways to reduce down risk. Numbers is one way to do that, but there are other levers we think we can pull to, and we're constantly assessing those, and you've seen us do that on cohorting, pre-departure testing, and so on, uh, and I think there are probably some even more initiatives that we can likely introduce there. Dr. 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 Uh, yeah, I'll come to Joe and then across to Ben. Um, Dr. Blanker, what prompted you to change your advice around pre-departure tests for New South Wales red zone flights to Auckland? Actually, uh, that was always the intention, and when we put up the advice initially around people flying back from New South Wales who were coming into MIQ, um, all of Australia was essentially on a, um, had an exemption from pre-departure testing. Uh, we uh, used it in a couple of settings, so people flying from Queensland and Victoria at different times, and then what we've done since is do the work to take Australia off the list of countries that are exclude, that have an exemption from pre-departure testing, and that work has proceeded as was signalled and has now come to, to its conclusion, and the decision has been made now to uh, require pre-departure testing for people flying from Australia. So in previous days when you had responded to me saying that you took into consideration the risk factor in terms of people going and getting that test, bear in mind at the time in New South Wales in early to mid-July, we're talking about 38 cases a day, you're now in an environment where you've got 1,500 cases a day and nine deaths. How is that environment less risky now? Oh, can I just jump in firstly and then come to Dr. Winfield? The, we don't seem to be acknowledging the fact that when we made the decision around pre-departure testing requirements, people had for quite some time been unable to travel from New South Wales into New Zealand. A decision was made that we would put on red flights but the amount of time people had to get on those red flights, from my recollection, was it was a very short window of time. Mm -hmm. So this, that was part of the issue as well, was the availability of those flights that we were opening up in order to get people then into a quarantine facility. That coupled alongside the uh, view of public health around the risk profile of there being roughly 38 cases a day versus going to get testing, when, of course, again, uh, testing in an environment where you're asking for a 72-hour pre-departure test doesn't necessarily pick up every risk. So those were all of the factors. Yeah. Um, on that, I do uh, want, I'm sorry, I just realised I cut off Dr. Bloomfield from answering your primary question. Though. Yeah, I mean, just, just to, to um, uh, reiterate that at the time, our considered public health assessment was that because we were putting in place a requirement for those people to come into managed isolation and quarantine, with day zero one testing and all the other measures in place, that there was not a need to add pre-departure testing at that point in time for people flying out of Sydney. Okay, but in terms of what you both said, the, the period in which those flights ran for was five weeks, and people would have had 72 hours, and the cases were at 38 odd a day, versus 1,500 now, and you've got a flight running next Wednesday, and the expectation is, is that you have a 72 hour period uh, before that as well. So yeah. um, I guess the question I'm trying to get an answer you to... You want to know why we didn't uh, bring it back in well, at some point? Well, you've brought it back in now, but the risk factor, and, and you have both said to me that it was about the risk factor of these people getting, picking up COVID if they went and got a test in conjunction with the 72-hour period and what um, constraints that would put on catching the flight. I'm trying to understand how going and getting a test in an environment where Delta is... 1,500 cases a day, how that environment is less risky than when there was 38 cases a day, because that was the rationale I got given. For so that's, you've, you've in, in itself, you've answered your own question because you've pointed out that it was not just one factor, there were multiple reasons we were given that advice at that time. So it wasn't just the single issue of, you know, what constituted the greatest risk for an individual. There were other factors in play, including the timing of those red flights. Now for using the risk, as a factor, if that risk is no longer a factor now? Uh, well, it clearly is a factor now because the risk has increased. Uh, go get a pre-departure That's right. We have, as I as signalled, as I said, we signalled right back when that advice was got, given that also Australia should be um, taken off the list of countries with an exemption from pre-departure testing, and the timetable for that was laid out, and we have now reached the point where that process has been gone through and has been implemented. And I just want to, re just, just to re reiterate, pre-departure testing is one mm -hmm. part 
of a suite of things that we do uh, to help reduce the likelihood that there will be an incursion across the border. And in fact, when we evaluated earlier on in the year, uh, we didn't find that pre-departure testing made a difference for people travelling from most of the countries that were coming to New Zealand. It didn't have any impact on the number that we were picking up at the border at the day zero one tests. And in fact, the day zero one testing was even more important than the pre-departure testing because of the risk that people can be infected subsequent to uh, the test or that they are already infected but too early on in the incubation period. Just lastly, Minister, on that, just lastly on hey, this, this is going to be the last one, Joe. You, you, you did say to me that the, there was a reduction in the amount of COVID cases coming into MIQ as seen through those day zero one tests, so I'm not sure that that actually marries. But also, can I just ask, in terms of the advice that you gave um, about this flight that is running next week, when did you give that advice to MIQ, to NB, to the government, whoever it was? Um, that pre-departure tests should resume again. Can I check uh, that we gave specific advice around that flight or um, that it it's just that it's captured in the fact that we were um, re removing Australia from the list of countries that were exempt from pre-departure testing? Mm -hmm. And just on the, for the former point, yes, we did see a reduction in cases coming through at the time pre-departure testing was introduced earlier in the year, but only from people travelling from the UK or from the US, which were our highest number of, of cases being imported at that time. So, so Prime Minister, is there yeah, anything to you. To you. Is there anything oh, sorry, I did say Ben. Sorry, Ben. You to swap deal with Spain. Um, yeah. You've previously spoken of your... Sorry, it's not a swap deal, it's a straight buy. You're Great, quite, go ahead. I apologise. You obviously announced the deal with Spain. Um, you've previously spoken of your personal admiration for Pedro Sanchez and your relationship with him. Do you do, does it, do that involve head of government contact? Do you do you reach out personally to him? Can you explain how you've landed on Spain? Um, well, look, there are there are a number of, of factors, of course. Uh, it, I don't think it's fair to describe any place in the world necessarily of ha as having surplus doses. Um, it's a matter of different places in the world being at different stages in their vaccine rollouts. Uh, and of course, I think the goal of everyone is to make sure that all of those doses are being utilised. And, and that is what everyone is working towards, the utilisation of those of those doses. Uh, and so part of our thinking was not just where we might be able to maximise the utilisation of those doses, it also actually mattered where um, doses were manufactured. We needed to get regular, as close to the regulatory alignment with the production of those doses so that they could match uh, our existing approvals. So that immediately narrows down the number of places that might be receiving from similar um, sites of manufacture and therefore that we could match our batches with. So quite complicated. Um, it is fair to say though that um, there was some leader to leader engagement um, and uh, I don't think that was necessarily determinative um, but uh, it just so happens that there were relationships there that meant that I could have those conversations and, and did so. Um, and that sometimes just um, possibly, I can't say the way, but sometimes possibly speeds things up. What were the needs for the vaccine that Australia ended up dealing with on, from Singapore and from the UK? I didn't hear the first half, sorry. In the mix previously for the vaccine that Australia ended up swapping oh, with? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say definitively. Um, it's fair to say that we had a, a number of early conversations and some of those early conversations were to, to narrow down because we had a very specific window and it was, you know, those, those, those two weeks in September because, of course, we've got those large doses coming through in October. So that's when we were looking for particularly, you know, the availability of, of um, doses, then the ability to deliver in that time frame all of the legal and regulatory requirements. So immediately that narrowed down some of those conversations quite quickly. I, as I've said though, um, the next um, agreement that we're working on is larger than this one, um, but we have good confidence that um, in conjunction, the two of them carry us through. Toba. Well, um, how concerned are you about freight supply with two inter-islander ferries out for maintenance later this month, leaving just one operational ferry? And is there any role in there for... I've not had anyone raise any concerns with me over that issue, and of course, uh, you, as you would expect, uh, with routine maintenance, of course, we'd always be seeking for those involved to have an eye to impacts um, on our supply chain, particularly given the environment we're in at the moment. Bloomfield, can you please clarify the rules um, for hairdressers? There's a bit of confusion within the industry about whether um, when a client is in the chair with the stylist, whether they have to take their mask 
keep their mask on or if they can take it off? It's a staff member that's meant to wear the it. The stylist is the person that has to wear the mask. Yeah. I've been thinking about this myself um, ahead of the weekend. I think it'd be very hard to have your hair cut, uh, whatever gender you are. Um, you do a trim. Uh, apparently. Um, oh. uh, uh, so Twitter says, um, uh, yes, it hard. I think if you've got a mask looped around your ears, so um, uh, it's definitely a requirement on the, the person doing the, the uh, coiffure. I can tell you that we have very pragmatic conversations about these issues when we work them through as a cabinet. Yeah. Twitter. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. The nurses' union's very concerned about the visitor policy at Auckland Hospital, yeah. and they've asked WorkSafe to get involved. Yes. Should this policy be changed? Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to let Dr. Bloomfield speak to because it's fair to say I was asking similar questions. Yeah, so two things on that. First of all, uh, one of my staff members made contact with the NZNO after they wrote to me last week, actually on the same day, has spoken to the DHB there, and what I can say is Auckland DHB's. Uh, visitor uh, approach to visiting is consistent with our national policy and we've encouraged and I think they're proceeding uh, to the NZNO to engage with the DHB to resolve the concerns and issues they had. At the same time, our team is working with people from across the DHBs to review and revise the visitor policy in light of the, the Delta, as we're doing with a lot of our work, and that work's uh, being concluded today, so there will be updated guidance which it will be our job is to make sure that all the district health boards have got that. It's a set of principles and guidance, and then, of course, we also rely on them to apply discretion in individual cases as long as they meet the uh, requirements which are keeping people safe, including staff, visitors, and, of course, patients. There's also, also, an, I'll let you, sorry, I'll there's also an obligation one and then the of um, sexual relations between a patient and a visitor um, at Auckland Hospital. Um, would you say that is this a um, high-risk activity in the current climate? Well, I, I think it's a high-risk activity, potentially. However, I don't know any of the details about that uh, interaction. I would say generally, regardless of the COVID status, that kind of thing shouldn't generally be part of visiting hours, I would have thought. <laughs> Rick um, we spoke to a whānau of 10 who's um, with positive cases yeah. and managed isolation yeah. at the moment. Has, kind of having a hard time just grappling yeah. with things. It's a bit of a tough time. So, so what's your message to those Fano members split up over different yeah. rooms and struggling yeah. with things? And, and, and we've talked about this on, on calls because it is, it is hard enough to be told that you and your Fano have COVID um, to also then uh, know that you're going to have to go into a, a managed facility uh, and that we may not be able to keep everyone together. That is really hard. I know the teams in our managed isolation facilities do their very best, but to the whānau in those circumstances, I really just want to say thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for everything that you're doing to help us uh, through what I know is a really tough time. We've also um, talked about the need for Māori, urging Māori to get vaccinated, yeah. urging Māori to get tested. Yeah. Um, how important do you think telling those types of stories is going to be to lift the number of Māori vaccination rates? The government's willing to do, maybe talk to Māori families and try and oh. spin that on. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, and actually the more willingness that we have from um, from everyone to talk about their experience with COVID, you know, it's it's one for, thing for us to stand up here and talk about it. Um, but I've not had COVID-19. I've not had the experience of getting that phone call to tell you that you have COVID. And I'm sure the fear that that creates in people I haven't had to stand alongside a hospital bed or see someone in my family with COVID-19. Those are the stories that we, we all need to hear because that's the reason we need everyone to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, I'm just going to counter it. So I haven't had Luke, and then I'll come to you in the front. Yeah. Yeah, just, just a couple. Um, just firstly on um, uh, the terrorist prime minister. I mean, you said last week that everything had been done to keep the Auckland terrorists in jail and public safe. Uh, the police didn't oppose him being bailed. Uh, do you stick to your position? Everything possible was done. And were you happy with that bail being proposed? Uh, yes, I yes I do. Um, I have seen uh, the police's explanation uh, uh, for those circumstances, and my recollection is that they had previously sought bail. But I would want to go and check their account again um, of that, those circumstances. But I know part of their rationale as well. Uh, was that um, their view was that they had exhausted all those legal challenge, uh, channels and needed to begin preparing um, for what they perceived to be an, an inevitable release at some point into the community. Keep in mind, he had been kept 
um, in prison for three years and, you know, large portions, as I recall, was on remand. Just and just on, um, just, yeah. just, uh, on one thing, Dr. Firstly, uh, we paid the same price for the uh, vaccine as we've been paying for Pfizer, or Spain get a bit of a finder's fee. And for Dr. Bloomfield, um, is there any specific advice around mental, uh, about person-to-person about -person interactions within the mental health space? Because obviously um, mask wearing can be a bit of a barrier and can make some of those interactions much more difficult. So I'm just curious about that as well. Uh, on the commercial arrangements, uh, uh, obviously, there's there's obviously going to be limitations to what I can I can talk about there, um, but um, uh, what I can clarify is that that very much New Zealand was going out and seeking the additional doses, so that might help in part answer one of your questions around finders fees, was it? Um, uh, otherwise, what I would say is that just our our experience here is that essentially the. Um, the European Commission and those um, countries who are looking to make sure that uh, that there is no wastage uh, are working really in good faith. That's all I've seen is nothing but but good faith here uh, in the experience we've had. It's just just around um, precautions, really, where there's a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction for a mental health consultation. Uh, yes, I imagine masks could be uh, a bit of a challenge there. And the important thing is that people take the sort of precautions that would be taken in any sort of clinical consultation, and that may include using physical distancing. But the most important thing here is for anyone seeking care is, of course, if you've got any symptoms that could be COVID-related, uh, related to, is to stay at home and get tested first. Uh, and a lot of interactions, mental health advice and interactions and in, in, um, uh, sort of consultations at the moment are being done by video as well at the moment. Um, just to if, look, if I may, I have in front of me um, now the uh, additional explanation on the question that uh, you asked regarding um, Friday's terrorist. Um, at the time that he was sentenced in the uh, High Court in July 21, he'd been in custody on those charges since August 2018, and the start point for sentence was set at seven months imprisonment. He'd been in custody in relation to the district char court charges for 10 months. So given the nature of the remaining allegations in the district court, imprisonment for 10 months was more than the equivalent of any custodial sentence that would have been imposed for that offending. So, um, yeah, I can, give you a, I can give you that written in full, but um, I believe that's information we can absolutely make. On the Spain deal, shouldn't New Zealand just get a bit of a ballpark idea of how much we've paid? So hundreds of thousands, millions? Yeah. Uh, we, we've, of course, I think New, Ze New Zealanders' interest would be that we are... Uh, ensuring that we, uh, as we always are in these commercial arrangements, um, negotiating with the taxpayer in mind. Um, but uh, it would not serve the New Zealand public if I were to, I think, reveal um, the outcomes of some of those ne commercial negotiations. What I will do is see just how we look to um, represent some of the overall, because you've seen previously we've talked about the overall spend on our vaccine program, so how we might represent that. But again, it, this is... This has really been a, a good, a, you know, I've seen nothing but goodwill, and I've seen that represented at every element of this arrangement. Can I clarify something? Uh, Claire. Oh, sorry, I'll let, you, I'll let you have another one, and then I'll come to you, clear. What other leaders have you spoken to about getting vaccines to you? Uh, one I'll speak to at the time that we talk about um, that arrangement, because I've been engaged um, with that second arrangement um, as well. Uh, but that actually... Actually, it's been those that we've been progressing that I've had contact with. Yeah. Can you at least say whether buying um, vaccines off another country rather than direct from Pfizer comes at a significant premium over buying straight from Pfizer? No. It, I would say it, it, you can see in my fact that I'm using language like good faith and so on, that what I'm trying to imply here is that the answer to your question would be no. Just just another to the, regulation. To the, uh, yes. the oh, and then I'll come back to you, James. On Pfizer vaccines, how much of that portion will go to the Pacific or at least yes. look forward to the distribution? Yeah, yeah. Like for the so, so one of the things that we've um, already confirmed as a cabinet is that we do and will support uh, our Pacific neighbours with their under-12 vaccinations. So it does enable us to do that in a timely way. And I think we're working through with MFAT the timing, because in some cases we will need to go in and provide um, uh, physical support for those rollouts, but for the 12 down to um, age 12 is the next phase that they're looking to roll out, and this will enable us to support that. Um, do you have for how many will 
Yes, we do have numbers for that, and we've made provision for that in, in, in our supply. Um, so, yes. I'll, I'll see if I can get you more detail on that. Uh, Dr. Greenfield, just, um, it was briefly mentioned by the Prime Minister, but um, the Tongan community in Auckland have started their own vaccination drive for their own community. Uh, I understand that the Wang community are doing their own vaccination drive. Well, what do you make of these like uh, specifically targeted um, ethnic vaccination drives within the Pacific community? Oh, look, it's uh, fantastic, and I, I, I huge support, really, for both the teams that are setting this up and also the people who are coming to be vaccinated. I saw a photo this morning from very early in the morning uh, for the um, event that's happening today among the Tong Tongan community and already a, a big queue of cars there. So just great to see that response, uh, that people are uh, taking up that opportunity. Coming back to the um, board... Sorry, Jane. Um, coming back to that, is there anything that's happened since you unveiled the plan in August that would push out the timetable for next year and including no. the trials for home isolation that are due to start in October? Yeah. On the overall time frame, no. Um, uh, no, there isn't. If anything, of course, we're seeing our vaccination programme really speed up. Um, and the quicker we can move through that, the more flexibility it does give. Uh, on the uh, self-isolation pilots, that work is continuing. Um, I've seen um, extra uh, briefings come through for extra decisions to be made on that, so it is continuing. Uh, what we're just mindful of, though, is we would want to deliver that in an environment that wasn't, for instance, a Level 3 environment. In part, it's because it will call on our, on our health resources in order to be able to deliver it successfully. Uh, and we're just mindful in a Level 3 environment, there's a bit more constraint there. So we'll be thinking about that as we continue to make those final decisions on timing. Can you, um, do you expect public servants to come back to work into Wellington to give central city businesses a bit more of a boost. Yeah, you'll 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 remember that um, uh, that has always been our position. Um, different departments will, of course, be issuing different guidance, and sometimes, you know, I notice that some, you know, start things on a Monday and bringing people back with their guidelines. But um, that has uh, often been uh, our, our urging. Um, but of course, the Public Service Commission will be much more familiar with some of the individual advice that's going out. I think clarify for another Mikey, industry. And then, and then Toba. Well, so I just wonder if you um, have um, asked for an explanation as to why the terrorist was kept in custody for three years when he was only facing a seven or ten month sentence. And are you satisfied that that didn't impact his mental health further? There were multiple. So there's additional information that sits alongside what I was just sharing with you, and I'm happy to give both Luke and yourself copies of that. Um, but keep in mind that... Uh, so, for instance, if I recall correctly, he had one set of charges relating to uh, objectionable material and possession of a knife that he was he received bail for. He then immediately, almost immediately on release, then went out and bought a knife again, went back, um, uh, faced um, charges again, and on that occasion was not granted bail because he had immediately reoffended on release. And over the course of his remand period, he also assaulted corrections officers. So there would have been a number of layered reasons and there were multiple charges he was facing that were the cause of, of him continuing to be uh, on uh, kept in prison for that period. Keep in mind, he was also offered mental health support whilst um, in prison, but that was not, um, that was not accepted. Prime Minister, oh, yesterday we asked, thank you, um, maybe this is for you, Dr Bloomfield, um, we sought clarity from the Minister yesterday about whether a, a hospitality venue that has a function room as well as a bar can use the function room and be classified as a, um, a private social gathering venue or if it applies under the, the, the kind of bar, nightclub type restrictions. Yeah. Do you uh, mean at the same time? No. So if you can, yeah. if you can basically host a private function yeah. and the the slightly more relaxed social gathering yeah. rules would apply but rather same than bar, num bar. Same numbers attached to each of them for consistency. Yeah. Look, I think the principle yeah. here is if the f facility has been hired as a room, as yeah. a venue, then it could be considered yeah. a private function. Yeah. But if hospitality services are being provided there, food and drink are being provided by that establishment, then it's a hospitality venue. And I would expect then that the, the normal um, uh, considerations would apply around yeah. spacing and seating and so on. Let's, let's just get um, uh, some confirmation of that, because my recollection, for instance, there'll be people that for a wedding will hire a, a venue in that nature. Um, and I think we might have some examples that we might be able to tease out. So do you mind if we just go away, just so we make sure that we... It's got a bit of a, um, 
the disparity between perhaps what the advice is and then also some of the enforcement with some of these. I know that. So if you could provide us with those examples, that will help us a little bit. So happy to take that away. It shouldn't be different to what we were doing previously. The only thing that's changed is the, is the cap for hospitality. Thanks. On the, ben. On the terror attack, have you given um, further thought to the appropriateness of what sort of inquiries you're yeah, doing? Yes. Because obviously the opposition leader has written to you giving yes. a public inquiry. Yeah. You're going to do it. Look, some of the rationale that's been given by the opposition leader, I disagree with. The, the, the statement that in part to support that um, uh, is, for instance, um, uh, a misrepresentation of the immigration law. However, on the question of an inquiry, we, we, have not, we have not ruled anything out at this stage because really what I'm waiting for, there are multiple agencies um, uh, or external um, entities that have the ability to inquire into this event. And we haven't yet seen um, the way uh, uh, or the breadth of those inquiries in the way that they may operate. And I really want to see uh, that detail because we may find that either uh, they cover the full breadth of what we do need to look into, or we may find there's a specific gap that needs to be filled. When will it start? Um, so I don't have an exact timeline, but keep in mind there's entities that have the ability to review individually into corrections, such as the Ombudsman. There's the IGIS that has the ability to look into our security and intelligence agencies. There's the IPCA and the coroner. So I want to I want to see the breadth of some of that work just to make sure, as I say, if there's a gap, we fill it. If if there's not, it may yet well be that they'll cover everything we need to know. Okay, uh, I'll leave. Last question. Oh, regarding um, contact tracing data, yeah. what is the specific legislation that protects people from their data being misused, or do we just take your word for it? That no, it you don't be? need to take our word for it. I'm looking down the back because... I know Minister Hipkins was seeking a bit more of advice on this matter, and I haven't had it seen it back yet. So, yeah. Oh, Can I just re reiterate Dr. one point? Might be able to speak of to course, it. when people use the app, the data that is collected from their scans or any man data mm. they enter manually does not go anywhere. Yeah. It stays on their phone, and it's only released with their permission once they uh, receive a message that suggests they may have been at a location of interest. So that data, right from the start, has been protected, and the Privacy Commissioner has approved that as a, uh, as a feature of the, the, the use of the app. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.